Ricker and Bond. Good evening, everybody. Another Ricker and Bond riveting episode. I'm Ricker. That's Bond. That's me. Uh, in depth, free flowing conversation about whatever's appropriate at the time. And, you know, from all coins to tech to pop culture, right now, what's appropriate is a little bit of cloud computing, Bond Gen. Oh, cloud computing is always I... appropriate because, you know, we're always using that cloud. And it's what's always more... just up above. <laughs> what? What's more appropriate than an expert on cloud computing? We have Ian Moist. What's going on, Ian? Hey, how you doing? Doing well. Doing um, great. So you're doing coming. Great. You're coming all the way from the the land of the UK, yes. I am the the land the land at this point in time as we record the land of desperate desperation for for petrol and fuel for your vehicle. So... <laughs> it, it, there is a gas shortage in there. Or a, well, or... yeah, we're told it's not a shortage. It's just a shortage of drivers. But okay. when you I heard a comedian the other night talk about that and say, well, try telling a scuba driver it's not a shortage of air. There's plenty of air. It's just not in your tank where you need it. So, you know. <laughs> I, I was following that a little bit, I, just a tiny bit, because I'm not super in-depth with it, but I, I thought it was pretty interesting. Oh, no, I was just going to say I actually wasn't familiar with this at all. Yeah. But I didn't want to veer off topic too much. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, they got less fuel uh, or less drivers, uh, according to, to Mr. Ian Moyes. Uh, a an expert in, in cloud computing and influencer in the space uh ranked number one uh by uh, certain publications probably the best publications if he's they're ranking him number one for uh, social influencing on cloud also a, a you know speaker on on social branding selling uh in general and uh and personal branding uh so we can hop into that uh first i kind of just wanted like can you define cloud computing in general yeah, that's a good one, right? The, the, the simplest definition is it's um, stuff that runs on other people's computers that you access on your devices. That, that's that's probably the simplest non-technical one, right? So so if you're on your smartphone, you know, and people often, you're using cloud computing and you often don't know it. That's the beauty of it, right? You, you'll be using an application on your smartphone like Shazam or something. And the real power that drives what you get from that application, you know, Google, Google Earth and this sort of thing, it looks like it's running locally, but the real heavy lifting and all the data and the clever stuff is being done on someone else's computer somewhere out, out there on the internet. But who cares? Because it's working for you, right? You've got, you know, Waze as a nav system. Think about that. Waze as a nav, sy nav system wouldn't work without cloud computing. And, and what we just lived through with COVID I think everyone listening to this in some way would have benefited from the beauty that cloud computing brings. We, 15 years ago, we wouldn't have been able to deal with COVID as we just have. We wouldn't have all hopped on video conferencing platforms um, at low or free cost and being able to switch them on overnight by, for millions of people and just get on with it because we, it just wouldn't have worked. So, uh, yeah, so we should all be thankful for cloud computing and, and what it lets us do in an affordable fashion right now what was it like um like how expensive was it to create an online service before cloud computing yeah it's an interesting one it also ages me a bit right with the way you asked the question of me um <laughs> but the, the problem would have been if this had been pre-cloud right like what would have happened would have been you'd say want to get some of this video stuff well we'll, we'll try and sign up for some product and you'd have pretty pretty much been queuing up with people with, with vendors telling you yeah 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 you're you're gonna have to wait six months while we buy some more hardware and configure it and do this and etc um unfortunately it's just the way it was things took longer but what cloud computing does is gives you virtually infinite compute power what well, it's called elastic computing what it means is it can burst to the requirement um as you need it and that's what we saw right we all in millions, in millions overnight, we went to Zoom, Google, Google Hangouts, Microsoft Teams, and they just worked. You just kept signing up and they, they were just ready for it. Um, so what, what's been happening over the years, and in the industry it's called the race to zero, is computing power has gone up and the price has gone down. When's that ever happened, right? We, when you get more for less. And that has been doing that really, really realistically for the last seven, eight, nine years now. And it keeps doing it. You know, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, and, and in Asia Pacific, Alibaba, you know, the big players are delivering more and more compute power and capability and flexibility. And that's what's causing innovation. 
that's why we're all seeing the likes of, you know, Amazon was early, but with Uber, just, you know, if you look at the Ubers, the Airbnbs, and all the other up and coming applications and online services that we all um, enjoy and take for granted, they've been made possible because of the innovate the uh, fundamental innovations of cloud computing. So going down through like, you know, that timeline of past cloud computing to now, um, you, you started at IBM, I saw on LinkedIn, is that correct? I, I did many, many, many years ago before uh, the word cloud and, and, and the way we digest stuff today was there with that, you know, it, it used to be mainframes where everyone connected remotely to them, similar to the internet, similar to what we do today, but the cost was prohibitive um, and it certainly wasn't as flexible and easy to create and develop. What we have now is anyone listening, if you're, if you're a programmer developer, you'll already be aware you can come up with an idea and from your bedroom, in mean, COVID times, it'll probably have to be from your bedroom and from what we've lived through, but you can power up immense computing power and pay for it in the seconds and minutes, right? You can power it up, test out, try stuff, and then switch it off 10 minutes later and only pay for 10 minutes usage, where is in those days when I started, you couldn't do that. You'd have had to go out and buy the kit, right? You'd have had to spend millions, even though you only want to use it for 10 minutes a week while you're testing, if they've got an idea to create something for nothing, as we've seen with so many examples now of, of the big brands that we take for granted, Facebook, prime example, right? That wouldn't have come about if, if, if the whole innovation of cloud computing hadn't been there for Zuckerberg to take benefit from. And I, I, I speak often on this, and right now there will be other brands that in five or 10 years we'll all be talking about that are out there right now that none of us have heard of, that we don't know, I haven't heard of. And suddenly they'll appear and they'll, you know, the TikTok came from nowhere, Instagram came from nowhere. The, the, there were a ton of others queuing up to be big, big, uh, successful organizations in the future. Interesting. Do you know, so I read recently that iCloud, a large percentage of iCloud is based on AWS. Is in, you know, Apple is like super big on privacy. Do you know why Apple would choose to, um, go with Amazon as opposed to building their own uh, like data centers? Is it like, is AWS like that good in terms of like, like I know it's yeah. good, but. Yeah, to, to, if, if you look at, you know what, there's a, you've got, you've really got, a, I always talk about mainstream in, in many countries, there's three main brands, right? It's, it's Google Compute, Amazon Web Services, AWS, and Microsoft Azure. And what they've built, and Amazon's got a head, had a head start, right, because of the scale. They, they've built that out for Amazon, right, as we know it, the Amazon storefront. And instead of um, just hosting with someone else, they built out their own infrastructure, and that led to them, and I'd argue by accident, creating Amazon Web Services because they realized, well, if we can do this for ourselves so effectively, they build their own kit, by the way, as well. If you look at Amazon, Amazon data centers, the kit in them isn't IBM or HP, it's Amazon. They build their own equipment. So they own it, they own it for the, the stack. And they've created the, another opportunity for themselves, right? They, they, it came off the back of the Amazon storefront as we know it. And through engineering and building to support that growth, they realized, actually, we've created another opportunity for ourselves. So the reason other vendors are going there is, do you really want to invest and reinvent the wheel and try and create, why not just use something that exists? And they're not the only ones. Lots and lots of major vendors, you know, from um, Salesforce, Oracle, Alexa in the industry are turning to the likes of AWS and saying, look, we'll, we'll, we'll move our stuff onto you. You take care of that because you can do it more cost effectively because you've got such a scale. Would Google be second or is Microsoft the second? My, I, typically, in my experience in the, in the cloud sector, you, you tend to see AWS and Azure usually um, the, the commonest two that the average business looks at hosting at. And then a lot of application providers um, look at Google Compute. And as I mentioned, you've also then got other players like Alibaba out there. Uh, in the Asia Pacific region, you've got Huawei, who've just launched a lot of cloud services and building up their own hosting. Um, but I always talk about the big three, right? The Magic, the, the Microsoft, MAG, Microsoft, Amazon, Google. And there are three commonest names that come up. 
Um, and then you've got around that lots of other hosting companies that are still big, like Rackspace, and then other localized around the globe hosting firms that have a niche that they address. But the bulk of the market sits with very few names. It really does, because they, they offer, for, for generic hosting of applications, they offer a scale and a price point that's difficult to compete with. It's just economies of scale, right? Is the future going forward? Because I thinking of like IBM and how they kind of lost mind share. I don't know if that came with other people scaling up with new tech or, or what, but obviously like people now don't really think of IBM as a, as a giant firm as they used to. In the future, is there a tech that will eventually scale down Amazon power from having that scale well one of, one of the challenges in in the industry is not tying yourself into those platforms right that, that that's the challenge because once you go down the amazon route it, it was always purported to be agnostic that the, the dream state was you, you choose which you choose one of them to, to, to post on but then if you want you can easily switch to another one I mean, it's not that easy unfortunately so ibm bought red hat for a, an extortionate amount of money um, and they're reshaping themselves as the, the easiest description is, is an abstraction layer. So i.e. that they're, they're what they've built is a way that you can build your application on um, the, the, the IBM platform that they've got there, um, OpenShift, and, and that will sit above AWS or Azure or Google. So you can create your application, code it, and that abstraction there means if you later want to re-platform it and say, well, actually, we don't want to be on AWS, we want to be on Azure, it's more portable to do so because you've coded to that layer in between as opposed to directly to AWS, et cetera. So I think what we're seeing is a lot of legacy vendors repositioning themselves and trying to readjust around what's happening in cloud. We've seen HP doing that with some of their storage options and trying to re-engineer and come out with new uh, new offerings that more address what's going on in the cloud market um, because what the reality in, in in the industry is businesses are going to be um, two things hybrid and multi-cloud right you, people like to think well we're going to standardize on one platform but large corporate organizations will have some azure some aws some google that so there's going to be a mix, and that's the that's the world that, that everyone's realised we're evolving into. So there isn't going to be one winner. You're going to you're going to have to deal with um, a new complexity. Cloud solves a lot of problems, but it introduces new ones. You know, it's just moving into a different wor a different world of of computing. How many? What's like the average number of data centers these these big players have, like in the United States? Do you, do you know what? I, off the top of my head, I don't know, but it's not in the. What they tend to do, they're not building thousands of them right around all locations. What they're looking to do is build. They're big. So if you look at an Amazon, an AWS data center, if you, you can go online, you can have a look at it. You can see virtual tours, etc. They are football, football stadium after football stadium next to each other. You know, lay them out. These are huge, huge um buildings and what is the and actual hardware is it like it's it's servers what, what like yeah I... it's still racks of, of of equipment it's still racks of computing power it's just instead of you having it in your office it's there and you don't have to maintain the power to it right you don't have to maintain the the, the equipment so you know the days when i i started in this is, is computing world you'd have a server in your office for your email server. You'd have another server for where you hung all the printers off it. You'd have another server, which was your database server, and you'd buy the kit, and you'd then put power into it. You'd then buy uh, an, a UPS next to it in case the mains power went to keep the thing running. And, and, and then if the motherboard or something went wrong in that server, guess what? You'd be in, un, unscrewing it and putting the hardware in and, and fixing bits. All of that now is it's not your problem. Right. And the beauty of doing it in the cloud is if a bit of hardware fails, you just keep running. You don't see it because they've built failover. They've built resilience into this. They've got all these racks of equipment and the applications don't run on one CPU. But if that fails, oh, we have to wait six hours while someone ships a new one in or two days. It doesn't matter. It's all architected to be failover. The whole 
The whole point should be you always have access from anywhere, anytime on any device. We take it for granted now, but it didn't used to be that, right? So now, if you'll take Facebook. Go on Facebook on your PC, go on Facebook on your Mac, go on Facebook on your phone, go on Facebook on your tablet, and it all adapts itself to whatever device you're on. And you can go on it 24 seven. And the majority of the time, there's always blips on anything, right? But if you think about over a year, it's very rare that any core application you want to access today isn't available to you. Mm-hmm. You go back 20 years, there would be times when for a day or two, you didn't have access to whatever the application was. It wasn't, a, if something failed in that server and the bit of kit was ordered, you'd have a techie telling you, yeah, we should, we, you should be able to access it by Friday. The kit's coming in on Thursday and then I need a few time to overnight do this with it. And then you can, what? But that was the world. Now, if you've got offline, if you're offline on, on some application, you know, what, what's your social media go, you know, go mad. Watch Twitter. Well, oh my God, Instagram's been down for 10 minutes. What the hell's going on? I can't survive. Mm-hmm. You can, because the expectation level is always available anytime, anywhere, any device. What's the cooling process like at these data centers? Well, yeah, that's what I was going to say. If you look at the locations where a lot of these data centers go, it's a good question is that that's one of the biggest issues, right, is the power um, and, and how they keep them cool and all the rest of it and temper, you know, because that, that, that affects the resilience. So if you look at where a lot of them are built, guess what? They're, they're built by rivers you look at, for, the, for the power and the water power, et cetera. So go and look at Amazon. There's lots of them built. Uh, you know, on the Mississippi and things like this. There's there's lots of data centers built in cold countries. You know, the Nordics region. There are data centers that are built near glaciers, et cetera, because they can use natural cooling, which makes it more green, more efficient, et cetera. Because the big problem, uh, two biggies are, A, they need an immense amount of power. And B, they need an immense amount of cooling. You can't you can't run these things. They're air, they've got to be run air conditioned, which again needs power. So the, there's a lot of smart decisions made about where they build them. It isn't just, you don't be, you try not to build them in the middle of a hot area where you've got to drive power to it. If you can build them on a river and use water flow as power and use cool, clever cooling techniques, so that there's a lot of uh, clever engineering goes on around how you build and operate these things with a, a, the maximum efficiency you can. We can get into your, your personal branding and, and what your advice for that in, in a second. But I want to ask you one question. Is it, any of this hardware that, you know, AWS, Azure, Google, can that eventually not be physical? Will it eventually have huge data centers that are not locally stored in physical places? Well, it, well it's got to run on something, right? It, 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 can't, it can't, can't run like uh, the Matrix film in, in, in imagination. It's got to run on a server <laughs> somewhere. So, um, what, what is happening, though, in the, in the technology industry in general is compute CPU power and, 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 you know, the CPUs are becoming more powerful all the time and new quantum computing and new ways of doing it so you can get more power out of smaller devices. And we've seen that. Think of the phone work market, right? Look at your phone today and look at a mobile phone when they, you know, even 10 years ago. They've got smaller and smaller in device. You know your your, your smart watches, your smart devices. You know your Google Glass, the the the, the rumored Apple gla- Apple glasses that are coming out, etc. They're able to get more computing power in smaller devices, and and cool them and and do clever things with them. You know the big the big challenge we've all got is um, battery power, right? It, we know that with electric cars is coming up with it they, they, that's the biggest evolution i think would change the technology sector as we see it is a new battery technology you know that, that lasts longer that's the thing we're all struggling with and they're all trying to figure out how do they engineer how do they reinvent battery technology that stores power for longer more effectively and that's the big challenge we, we've all got it right we all plug in our phones our watches and a lot of people, their cars now, um, if they can elongate the length of charge that we can get from that, that will change so much that we could, we're capable of doing. Yeah. So people are plugged in digitally doing remote things. I said to you that uh, I think a lot of people are going away from 
trying to get employed by big companies and try to do their own things. Um, and, and, you know, software helps with that of kind of having like a, a personal stack of software that is their business. Um, so you, you made yourself an influencer in this space and, and I know you talk about the importance of branding yourself as a person. I was thinking even as companies too, but talk, talk about the, the importance of, of branding oneself in, in a digital age. Yeah, and, and I fell into this by accident. I didn't set out to, to figure out how to do this. And I know a lot of um, people say, well, I want to be an influencer. And I've got one of my daughters said that before because she sees some of the ones on uh, online and YouTube and stuff. And, you know, it's we don't just apply for that job. It's you've got to have a voice. You've got to contribute. And as often, as there is often with... Um, artists and, and you know comedians etc they, they've got instant success well actually no they did 15 years 20 years of the circuit before they got spotted but you just haven't seen that so I I, I was contributing content writing blogs uh, speaking at events um, just doing a lot of stuff and slowly got approached by different big vendors to well could you do one for us could you contribute to this could you come and speak at this event and slowly, slowly, I've ended up being uh, a thought leader and influenced in the cloud computing space for a lot of major brands. But it, it, it hasn't happened overnight, right? And it, it's not something I just applied for online and, and tomorrow I was, was doing. But personal branding came as part of that, right? I, I slowly realized that as part of that, more people would check me out. More people would spot me online. And social media during that period became more of a must have it you know everyone's on it um and different so many different platforms so one of the bits of advice i'd give to people and and now because of covid you know during covid we've seen digital transformation and online digital profile jump forward seven to eight years that's known in the industry that's happened you know we we had our expectations and and predictions uh where we'd be in seven ten years and we've let forward because we've all been forced to go online, find new ways of working, et cetera. So I, what I say to people is, you, you, people say, well, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not an influencer, I'm not a celebrity, I, I don't have a personal brand. Everyone has a personal brand. Forget online, you have a personal brand. Personal brand is others' perception of you based on anything they have access to. So if you've met them in person and you've spoken well at a meeting, and then other people have talked about you and what you've done. The perception that people have of you from that in engagement is what they see as your personal brand, what you stand for, what you know, your value. The reality today, though, of course, is because of social media and, and what the web brings is you have the ability to, to control and create your own personal brand and go global with it very cheaply, if not free. You know, have you got a LinkedIn profile, a Facebook, a Twitter, an Instagram, a TikTok, whatever, is anyone that can find you and anything they can see represents your personal brand. So for me in B2B, LinkedIn's an obvious one and Twitter are the two commonest platforms that people would look at me on. And I cultivate what content goes on those platforms. I make sure I look good because today the first impression is more often digital. You know, guys, we've jumped on here now. It's very easy for you to have checked me out beforehand, looked at my LinkedIn, look, search my name in Google, and you'll find stuff and make decisions based on it, based on what you can see. So positively and negatively. So here's the thing. Anyone listening to this, it, it can affect your career as well. Employers, the HR team there, the recruitment team, the recruiting manager, boy, you know, I recruit people. So I advise people on this. Um, we can check you out in seconds. You know, you apply for a job. I can search, even if you haven't, you haven't put the web address in, you haven't put your Facebook profile on there. Yeah, well, I've got your name. I know where you live. I know where you worked previously because it's on your CV. So I just whack it into Google and it does the work for me. And your social profiles, because based on the, based on the, the indexing, more often than not, your Facebook profile, your LinkedIn, your social profiles are going to be at the top because they get high rankings naturally based on those platforms. So I'm going to find you. It doesn't take much. And if you've left your Facebook profile wide open with all your college parties and stuff on it, you can argue, well, that's my right to, right? Yeah, but I can see that. And you don't know what I've looked at. 
and, and, and don't give me the comment that, well, it's never affected me. You don't know. You don't know, right? If you didn't get shortlisted for a job, you don't know the hiring manager didn't see more pictures of you drunk and partying and make that judgment, you know, incorrectly by all means. But if that's the perception they've got, that was your personal brand in their mind. You can argue it's wrong, but they won't tell you. You'll never know. And it's done its damage. So simple things are, if you've got stuff out there, limit it, you know, and limit it to who you want to see it. Control your personal brand and make yourself look good online because it, it's your personal brand. When you move job to job, it's yours. You know, get good stuff on there. And, and the stuff that you may not want an employer to see or a potential employer, just turn it off so your friend, only your friends and family and, and connected people can see it. In which case, it can't do damage. But the people you want to see, it still can. There you go. It's a couple of clicks. You just think about it. This is, I talk about this in the business world a lot. And it, it's other people like me who, who speak on this. We, we're all aghast often at what people, people who don't realize and don't take note of this and what they allow to happen to their own, you know, profile uh, and allow people to see. Yeah. In, in your case, especially I mean, coming from like a podcast host perspective, super curated on LinkedIn, super easy things to, to you know, a title to talk about you. Uh, you got 29 experiences that are posted on there. Um, so I could, I could, it's a very deliberate, you know, branding indeed of, of yourself online. Thank you. The beauty of it is, right, guys, it, it, it brings you opportunity. It brings you opportunity in jobs and other things, you know, cultivate. You, you've all got expertise and experience, no matter how young you are. You've got innovation. You've got ideas. You can represent yourself. That's the beauty that we all live in now. You want to create a blog, you can go and post it on LinkedIn. You don't even have to know how to have a blog or you don't have to use WordPress. You can go and just create a, an article on LinkedIn and it's a blog against your own profile. If you've got some value to give, put it out there. You don't know. That's how it happened to me, right? I talked about things that I knew and understood um, and experiences I was having in my, in my job and data industry. And then big brands started reaching out to me, saying, could, 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 could you write something like, something like that for us? We really enjoy, we, we spotted you doing this. And then they published me on their page. And guess what? Then someone else spots it. You create this snowball effect of opportunity where virtually every week now I get invited to be on a, a panel or could, could you come and speak at this event or could you come, could we fly you out to, out to Barcelona and, you know, speak at the SAP big customer event and interview a customer for us and do, you know, they'll find you. You, you want to create your own opportunity. It, it's out there if you want to do it. Do you think it's dangerous to have no online presence at all? Yeah, I do. And, and unless you, you're working in an environment which that's appropriate for, right? So I always say, you know, to the hairdresser, not, not that I've got much hair to worry about styling, but, um, you know, the internet, I always joke to them, how's the internet going to affect them? But do you know what? COVID, they have changed their model and, and, and now you, they have an online booking system and it manages it and they've got queues and they market themselves better online, but they, but their product won't be replaced, right? You, you've still got to go and physically get your hair cut. You, there's no way of digitizing that. But what they have done is use digitization to reach out to more customers and et cetera. But yeah, I, I think it is dangerous not to be online. And if you're, if you're going to work in a secure environment in the government, they probably don't want you to be online and turn all your profiles off. Yeah. So there are certain exceptions that always are right. I never say one, one size fits all. But in the majority of cases, it, it's more positive opportunity for being uh, managing your online brand than just turning it off and having nothing. Yeah. Awesome. Ian Moyes, is there anything uh, you would you have a, a parting sentence to give to people listening and watching? I, I think embrace, embrace technology. We, we, we live in a time where there is more opportunity. There's more good than bad, right? About internet, cloud, social media. It, it creates so much opportunity to create something new, to create new value quicker than ever before. Years ago, if you wanted to create a Fortune 500 valued company, the average time to create be in the Fortune 500, I remember looking this up, was something like 62 years. Wow. Um, it's like somewhere around there. 
recently, the average time has been a five to six years. If you look, go and look at the top 10, 20 Fortune 500 companies, and nearly all of them were created in the last 15 years. It, it's incredible. So you have the opportunity to create immense value for yourself and a company in a shorter period of time than was ever possible in essence because of what technology provides. It's whether you grab that opportunity and do something with it. 30 seconds, thoughts on blockchain. Yeah, block, blockchain is an interesting one. It's, it, I think I don't think we've seen the revolution it's, it, it, it's what it's going to bring to the financial community. It cha- transforms and changes the whole way the monetary economy works. Um, you know, we see Bitcoin and everything. I, th- I think there's a whole evolution going on. Um, the world's going to, th- I think the world in 15 years time, we've seen immense change in the last 15 years. I think due to the likes of blockchain, AI, um, you know, Bitcoin, all these things, next 15 years, I think we're going to see more change than we have in the past 15. One really do. Absolutely. Yeah. Where can our listeners find you on social media? What are your social Username. Thank you. And that also gives another personal branding tip to make it easy for you. If you go to ianmoist.co.uk or ianmoist.cloud, they will take you straight to my Twitter and LinkedIn profiles where you'll see me post content of examples of personal branding. I'm still learning, so I'm not saying it's perfect, but you'll see examples of hopefully how to do it well that will uh, give you tips and hints that you can plagiarize on your journey. And, and how can we help you out in, in your journey? Anything we can do? No, this is it, right? You, you give me a voice here kindly to a new audience and hopefully there'll be new followers there that will engage with me. I learn from my followers as they learn from me. Right? I'm still learning. I'm still learning from young people who've got new ideas and new thoughts that I haven't had, right? I've, I've been on a journey, but that also hinders me in the, my mindset is on my experience. So I, I, I get lots of people reach out to me and uh, look forward to that. Awesome. Thank you, Ian. Thank you so much, Ian. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.